Today we are going to be continuing anemia 2. And we'll be starting with iron deficiency anemia. We'll be doing it in a bullet form. So iron deficiency anemia. It's the most common cause of anemia worldwide. Menstruation is the most common source of blood loss followed by GI bleed. This anemia is seen in infants who get human milk and is common between six months and three years. This anemia is also seen in pregnant females. There will be increased TIBC and transferring levels and the ferritin will be low, but is the most reliable test to establish iron deficiency anemia. Serum iron is low, MCV is low, and on the peripheral smear, the red blood cells will be microcytic and hypochromic. This is treated with iron, which is ferrous sulfate replacement. The next anemia we want to talk about is thalassemia. These are inherited anemias and are classified based on the chain that is deficient. In beta thalassemia, the beta chain is deficient and in alpha thalassemia, the alpha chain is deficient. Beta thalassemia major is sometimes called Cooley anemia and occur predominantly in the Mediterranean. This affects infants, resulting in growth retardation and failure to thrive. On peripheral smear, microcytic and hyperchromic red blood cells are seen. Target cells may also be seen. Hemoglobin electrophoresis shows increased hemoglobin F and hemoglobin A2. This is treated with frequent packed red blood cells transfusion. These patients are transfusion dependent. In beta thalassemia minor, beta thalassemia minor is a chronic anemia and chronic anemia is the only symptom in beta thalassemia minor. These patients are not transfused dependent. So in beta thalassemia minor, there is chronic anemia and the chronic anemia is the only symptoms. And these patients are not transfusion dependent. Treatment is usually not necessary. Persons with alpha thalassemia may be asymptomatic and no treatment is necessary. So just to summarize it and make sense of it all, in thalassemia B uh, major, um, transfusion is absolutely necessary. And in beta thalassemia minor, transfusion is not necessary. Here are the target cells in thalassemia major and what they look like. It has a bullseye appearance. The next um, anemia we want to talk about is sideroblastic anemia. This may be acquired or hereditary. It is caused by abnormality in the red blood cell iron metabolism. There is increased serum iron and ferritin. TIBC saturation is normal or elevated. This may be caused by drugs, toxins, such as chloramphenicol, alcohol, and exposure to lead. Treatment includes removing the offending agent and adding pyridoxine. 
Ring sideroblasts are seen in the bone marrow. And this is a picture of what ring sideroblasts look like. The next anemia we want to talk about is anemia of chronic disease. This type of anemia occurs in association with infection. The inflammatory cytokines that are released suppress the production of red blood cells. There is low serum iron, low TIBC, low transferrin, and elevated ferritin. Red blood cells are usually normocytic and normochromic. These patients do not need any treatment with iron. The next type of anemia is aplastic anemia. This anemia is due to bone marrow failure. This bone, the bone marrow failure also leads to pancytopenia. This anemia is usually associated with radiation therapy, but may also be due to medications such as chloramphenicol, sulfonamides, and carbamazepine. These patients show signs and symptoms of thrombocytopenia, such as petechiae and easy bruising. They also have increased incidence of infection due to neutropenia. The red blood cells are usually normocytic and normochromic. This anemia is usually diagnosed from a bone marrow. These patients are usually treated with bone marrow transplant. The next anemia is vitamin B12 deficiency. Vitamin B12 binds the intrinsic factor to facilitate absorption in the terminal ileum. The lack of intrinsic factor will result in the failure of B12 absorption and lead to pernicious anemia. It is the most common cause of B12 deficiency in the Western world. Other causes of B12 deficiency include gastrectomy, Crohn's disease, and poor diet. These patients will have stomatitis or glossitis, which is soreness of the tongue. These patients can present with neuropathy and signs of dementia. The MCV is usually over 100 and the red blood cells are large. On the peripheral smear, there are hypersegmented neutrophils. Serum B12 level is usually low, less than 100 pg per ml. Both serum methylmalonin acid and homocysteine are elevated in B12 deficiency. Schilling test is used to determine if B12 deficiency is due to pernicious anemia. The next anemia we want to talk about or the next deficiency is folate deficiency, which can affect the production of red blood cells. Green vegetables are the main source of folate. Folate deficiency may be due to alcoholism long-term use of oral antibiotics, pregnancy, hemolysis, methotrexate, and phenytoin. The presentation of folate deficiency is similar to B12 deficiency without the neurologic symptoms. The next thing we want to talk about is sickle cell anemia. It is an autosomal recessive disease. This means that both parents have to have the abnormal gene in order for the disease to be expressed in the offspring. Sickle cell disease has the abnormal hemoglobin S. Hemoglobin S is different from hemoglobin A by its substitution of valine for glutamic acid 
at the sixth position. When acicular's oxygen is low, the abnormal hemoglobin S cause the red blood cells to sickle and obstruct blood vessels resulting in ischemia. Sickle cell disease is most common in black people. Pain crisis is the most common clinical manifestation. Other clinical manifestations include splenic infarct, prior prism, renal papillary necrosis, high output heart failure, goldstone, pallor, jaundice, stroke, and bone pain. Acute chest syndrome is the most concerning complication and may lead to myocardial infarction. These patients are usually asplenic because the spleen is destroyed. As a result, they develop frequent infection with encapsulated organisms like H. influenza, Streptococcus pneumoniae, and Salmonella. A vascular necrosis of the bone is seen mostly in the hip and shoulder. Hemoglobin electrophoresis is required for making the diagnosis. The next thing is hereditary thyrocytosis. This is an autosomal dominant disease in that only one parent needs to have the gene to pass it on to the offspring. Red blood cells surface is affected but not the volume so that the spherical red blood cells are trapped in the spleen. These trapped red blood cells are hemolyzed in the spleen resulting in extravascular hemolysis and splenomegaly. On peripheral blood smear, sphere-shaped red blood cells are seen as depicted in the diagram below. After splenectomy, these patients need to be immunized against encapsulated organisms. This is treated with blood transfusion. The next one is G6PD deficiency. This is an X-linked disorder that mainly affects men. There is an enzyme defect in the red blood cells that cause hemolysis. The deficiency of this enzyme, which is the G6PD, causes the accumulation of H2O2 in the red blood cells, which denature the red blood cells and result in the formation of Heinz body. Heinz bodies attached to the red blood cells membrane making it very stiff. As a result, red blood cells are destroyed easier in the spleen. Hemolysis commonly occurs when the red blood cells are exposed to sul sulfonamides, nitrofurantoin, primaquine, dimercoprol, and faber beans. In addition, infections may also trigger a reaction. It is important to remember that in any anemia with hemolysis, LDH and indirect bilirubin will be elevated, but haptoglobin will be low. The last anemia we want to talk about is autoimmune hemolytic anemia. This is an anemia that is due to antibodies attaching to the membrane of the red blood cells which eventually causes hemolysis. The antibody type might be either IgG or IgM. There are two types, warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which is due to IgG and is more common than cold. And the second type is cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which is due to IgM. The warm type occurs in warm weather and the cold type occurs in cold weather. On the peripheral smear, if it is the warm type, you will see spherocytes. And if it is the cold type, the red blood cells will aggregate. 
the direct Coombs test is done for both the warm and cold types. If the Coombs test is positive for IgG on the surface of the red blood cells, it suggests a diagnosis of warm hemolytic anemia. If the Coombs test is positive for complement alone on the red blood cells, it suggests a diagnosis of cold hemolytic anemia. Also, there will be cold agglutinin titer in cold hemolytic anemia. Warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia may be treated with steroids and splenectomy. If a patient did not respond to splenectomy after they receive the, uh, the procedure, they may be given rituximab. Cold type may be treated with rituximab. However, steroid are of no benefit to those patients. Well, this brings us to the end of the brief overview of the different types of anemia. Thank you for listening, and I hope this information was helpful to you. Please don't forget to check out the other videos and like, subscribe, and share. I wish you well. Good night.